And we're live. All right. Good evening and welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today's Monday, August 10th, and we're a little late. We have, are having some technical issues, so we got those resolved, and we are now live. <clears throat> and we've got um, a number of things on our agenda tonight. At 7.15, we've got a, a, we're going to go over our municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. Um, so hopefully we can get a few other things in ahead of time. We have a poll hearing that's scheduled. We have our uh, COVID-19 emergency update. We're going to and we may have some things to discuss about uh, returning college students, although they're not really returning, only a small amount of them are. Um, we got a discussion of benchmarks for the employee wage and the adjustment COLA and any uh, updates from the select board and the town administrator. And then we've got a sewer abatement discussion for 155 North Silver Lane, a quick discussion about surplus fire equipment, CPA rental assistance agreement and discussion about an AARP age friendly communities application. <clears throat> so our first item on our agenda is our poll hearing. So I guess we'd like to open up the uh, poll hearing on that one. <clears throat> and I understand that we don't have anybody from Eversource here tonight. That's correct. And <clears throat> just looking for on here the address. It's two poles, and I'll pull them up. They're okay. north and south of Silver Lane on North Main Street. Yep. <clears throat> 22 feet from the road center line, it says. And the second Correct. new pole to be placed northerly of the pole. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, these are clearing ways for the change in that little triangle island, I think. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That will be part of the North Main Street project. Yep. So I tried to circle these in red if I'm reading these plans correctly. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. <clears throat> so they're getting to, to either side of that because we're turning that into a regular T intersection, right? In the, in the project. Correct. So, okay. <clears throat> so on those symbols, Tom, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like both direction and guy are north to south. Nothing's going perpendicular to the road. That's what the, that's how they've got that line oriented through it, right? As I show mm -hmm. the guy wires? Yeah, direction of, direction of circuit and any guiding. Okay. <clears throat> so that should minimize any obstructions there. There's no bracing poles, just wires. They're stretching that span out. Okay. Yeah, because sometimes they do put one of those bracing poles on there. <clears throat> and I could see why that they wouldn't do that there because of what's around it and everything. It does make sense. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm just looking at our procedure. They're supposed to be sending us... Um, the butter cards to the select board office <clears throat> and the petition orders. We've got our hearing date. <clears throat> and do we get any information from the highway superintendent at all? Or any information, Jeff? Yeah, he, he had no concerns with no concern. uh, moving them. Okay, all right. <clears throat> this is all in the public way. <clears throat> and while we've got is there are there any anybody with any public comments on right now that'd like to make any comments on the poll hearing any of butters no oh, butters excuse me <clears throat> no, no, either way anybody but yeah yeah that, that's what i figured Pick up larry and phyllis without asking okay We do have, hold on, I'm just looking at John's comment there. Well, we can mention that, John. I don't, if John's got a comment, um, just wondering if the, uh, 
the pole next to the crosswalk might be better placed on the other side of that sidewalk? On, on the north side? Where is this? Was what is it? Uh, let's see. Yeah. What is this? This is a pole hearing. A pole? A telephone pole, whatever. You can't put a, move a pole without a hearing. So these are the two pole placements. Where, where is it? If you get a chance, you might want to mute there, Jim. I think that's um, Larry and Phyllis. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, if you can just mute. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm looking for yeah, we could, we could certainly ask them uh, about the decision. I know that there, um, there, there is the, I think, the crossing signal on the you northern know. side of the crosswalk. And that's that affected the decision or not. Yeah, that could be. And that's it rectangular flashing beacon that they've got pointed out right there, right? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> so we can add that to the questions and then I guess we'll we'd have to we'll have to continue to our next meeting and try to get them in here, right? Yeah. So Jeff, Jeff, this is the only poll change that we have with respect to the North Main Street reconstruction. Uh, th this is the only significant one. I think there might be one or two that are moving a couple of feet mm -hmm. um, north or south, but but this is um, yeah the on the only significant ones that that required a public hearing. And so the the point that John was making in his uh, text in his comments were that the pole south of the sidewalk um, is a little close to the crosswalk. Is that correct, John? Yep. Yeah, because it's like right near the perimeter line of it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, maybe they can I mean, shift it a little south. Yeah, just a, like even a couple of feet or something. Yep. 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 Yeah, if you push it a little bit, makes much, sense. If they can stretch the span, go a little bit south of there, and then the sidewalk, uh, excuse me, the crosswalk and its intersection as well as the beacon can can kind of have their own presence as opposed to being in a in a maybe being um cluttered by a pole right yeah so jeff if you're okay with that and tom and david we could ask to have, move that south whatever the distance they're comfortable with um i tend to agree with that the sidewalks living near one gets a little busy yep your, your use of the word cluttered is a good description of it because it it's just kind of like dumping all that stuff right down in that spot and you really want a nice clear egress through that crosswalk. Crosswalk and turning left. You're coming up. You're coming yes, up. Yes, that's right. Last thing you want is another one. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to look at where the next one is. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Excellent. So do, um, do we take a vote to continue the public hearing at a, uh, our next meeting? Yes. Well, knowing that we're only going to ask for some slight movement in the southern pole on the south side of the intersection, why wouldn't we just have it contingent, grant the poll contingent on moving that on the move, on the move. Yeah. moving it just as far as they can. It's not hundreds and hundreds of feet of span. Right. It's like a and, couple of feet or so, give or take. Yep. And they're going to be yeah. all taller new poles as the circuits have been built throughout town. Those poles are taller, which allows for a, a little bit more span. The circuit itself isn't changing. So if we ask them to push it back five feet or whatever makes sense to accommodate uh, clear lines in the crosswalk, I'd be comfortable with uh, voting to approve contingent on that move. That's probably okay. called forces their hand. Yep, that would be a good idea. That's fine, Scott. I like that. Okay. So we'll take that as a motion, Scott. Yep. Move exactly. to, okay. Yep. 
And uh, did you second, Tom? Second. Okay, thanks. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. All right. So let us know when they uh, respond back to that, Jeff, and we can wrap that up. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Uh, now, would would there be any objections if we uh, take Larry and Phyllis's item next? Yeah, close the hearing. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to close the hearing. Do we have a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. Uh, second? second. All those in favor for closing the poll hearing? Aye. 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 All right. Um, I think maybe we can hop down and let Larry and uh, was it Jim and Sue, whoever we've got for our sewer abatement. Yeah, I think that's Jim. Is it Jim? Okay. So why don't we do that and then we can. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have any problems with this. They uh, complied with everything. So I'd, uh, I'd like to move to. Uh, Go back to single, single rate for their facility now, their house. Okay. Is there a uh, second on that, or any discussion? Uh, second for discussion. Yep. So this was a, this was a home business that was essentially broken back down and turned into a single family residence. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Easy then. I just wanted to have that out there for clarification. Yep. Since did you um did you have a Point you want to make, Jeff? No, I, yes. I have it. I'm sorry. Were you talking to Jim? No, oh, Jeff. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, well, I, I guess I was just going to ask. Um, I was going to ask Jim if the request was for uh, fiscal year 21 just to have the single rate, or or was there a fiscal year 20? Um, abatement request as well there's no reimbursement request okay. we're just we're just looking to then the next billing cycle just to go down to one 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 unit Thank okay you. all right okay any other uh discussion or questions yeah all, right. all good thank you for that all right all those in favor aye 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 all right thank you thanks jim Here. and thanks, sue guys. And make, enjoy, enjoy the retirement. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> now we'll just pop back up and, and hit things in order um, for our minutes for July 27th. Motion. We have a second on those? I'll second. All right. All those in favor of the minutes of July 27th? Aye. 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 All right. Three to zero on the minutes. All right. <clears throat> and now it's time for our biweekly COVID-19 state of emergency update. Oh, there she is. Hey, Good. Lori, how are you? Good, how are you? All right, thanks. Good. Um, the only update I have is um, we were notified on Wednesday that there is one new contact case in Sunderland. Oh, so it's our first one since of, March or so, or May, I think. Okay. May, it's right? May. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So but that's the only update I have. You know, okay. I'm looking forward to the discussion of what the return of the college students or the non return of the college students. I was going to say we can roll right into that if you don't have anything else. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Because I think they're only now looking at bringing seven to eight hundred, I believe, Jeff, back, or so. Uh, yeah, I think that's about the number under a okay. thousand. Um, <clears throat> only those that have to have in-person classes or laboratories or capstone projects yep. um, are going to be allowed on campus. My understanding is uh, that. Uh, there's going to be limits on even off campus students traveling on campus for things like meal plans and, and services, um, you know, typical university services as well. Um, 
and that was announced late on Thursday, I think. Right. Okay. So that should make an impact. And I noticed uh, Smith has gone to all remote, so they were Mount Holyoke as to well. Mount Holyoke, yep. Did Amherst College go all remote? I don't recall seeing anything about them yet. No. Okay. See that either. Oh, so that was the only one in the region that I haven't seen. And and I think Hampshire is Hampshire. still planning. Yep. Oh. Although their student body, I'm guessing, is a little smaller now than it used to be. So <clears throat> that may not have quite the impact that UMass would have on the area. <clears throat> so if I if I could ask the mm. question in and around the return of college students, we're we're talking about the campus. If Saturday's paper is correct, the Jones Group and a handful of other property owners in and around Amherst are uh, seeing brisk business in leases later in the season than they normally have. I noticed so, that. So does that mean that students are returning to the Pioneer Valley and not necessarily to the campus? And if so, what, what should we be prepared for as a municipality? Yeah, that's a good question, because I noticed those two things kind of conflicted with each other, you sure. know, unless there's some kind of huge burst in rental activity that isn't related to students, but it doesn't it's seem that way. It's certainly not job growth. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I have been having conversations with uh, university officials for the last couple weeks, uh, just in general before this happened, uh, talking about what the plans were and, and how to coordinate. Um, we had a meeting uh, with police chief and the board of health chair, um, talking about how to communicate, uh, you know, if, if they learn of a, a student who lives in Sunderland having, you know, contracting it, how that's gonna get communicated, make sure there are open lines of communication. Um, I have another call set up for tomorrow with specific questions um, under trying to understand you know the uh, previously there was a, an agreement that students living on or off campus had to sign about the precautions they were taking um, on the website it says that all students whether living on or off campus are going to be tested by the university is that still true um, so it, just getting getting more clarity and understanding from them how we can collaborate to make sure that everybody is safe and healthy um, in this new approach. So, you know, one of the things that they talked about is requiring all off campus students to register their local addresses. And so putting in a request saying we'd like to know what those addresses are or how many people, you know, um, one of the repercussions that's been mentioned about this decision is um, you know, the potential for a reduction in workforce. So understanding how many people from Sunderland that live in Sunderland are employed in the university would be an important thing to know. Um, so I think we're trying to get those questions answered as best we can. But if there are others um, that you want to mention now or email me, make sure that, that we get answers to. Um, I am in, in communication with them. Um, and, and I'd also mention that Senator Comerford is on the sort of UMass Amherst slash Amherst working group on COVID. Um, so I think that she's going to be also sort of the regional representative um, on that group. Okay. That's good. At least it gets a little attention then in, uh, in Boston anyway. <clears throat> And that was one of the questions I had was the, the student agreement, if that was still in effect then given that. So that'll be interesting to see. I, I would hope they'd still keep it in effect, but. Right, and then, you know, my follow-up question to that is if it is, uh, you know, what is the reporting mechanism? Um, right. yep. You know, they, the they're not on campus, so there's no campus safety to be looking at them. So if somebody else notices that something's happening, how do we inform the university that, that something needs to be investigated? Um, how do we even know if they're students that are, you know? Right, out of, lots out of, of questions. Right, because the communication goes both ways. So how do they notify us, for instance? Yep. All right. Uh, question. Um, 
from Larry and Phyllis. We know mm -hmm. in Amherst, the police meet weekly with the university to deal with what they refer to as off-campus uh, conduct and um, violations of the student code of conduct and whatever. Given that there's so many students in Sunderland, is it possible first for us, for Sunderland to get someone on that board that's now meeting and second for the police to get involved um, directly with the university? Well, that's a good question. And I see somebody who might be able to have some in uh, input on that. All right, Chief, how are you? Hi, good evening. Uh, we, had, we have met with them in the past. Uh, we haven't had too many of the students uh, that would be violent, uh, but we just started to meet with them again. Uh, I guess the person that they had as a contact to us no longer works there. So a lot of the contact information went away. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, the meeting last week that Jeff spoke about, we, uh, we in, in put in our information so we would get updates and who we're supposed to be calling uh, if we have any student violations. It was also interesting to hear Jeff mention the word uh, communicate. Um, I think it's important, maybe through the um, various, or at least the larger apartment complexes, to get the word out that, um, look, you got 7,000 kids that aren't going to be in a dorm anymore. They're looking for, some of them are going to want to come here any place. They're looking for a place to be. It's important that they understand what their responsibilities and expected behaviors are. Um, wherever they're living, but you know we care most about Sunderland right here. All right, definitely. And that, that's one of the things that, that we had talked about uh, with the chief and and the board of health chair is you know they give out information packets to all off campus students, and I think this year they're they're going to be including masks and hand sanitizer, and so communicating with off campus housing about how do we do things like here's how you sign up for Sunderland Code Red to learn about an important announcements. Here, you know, here's an important contact, you know, local municipal contact information and um, other information that that the town wants those students to be aware of. They were more than happy to include that um, in in their distribution of information. And, and we also talked about other ways of not necessarily COVID related, but um, welcoming them to the community and saying you, you are part of the community. Um, you know, here, here are some important things to know um, and just other ways of, I guess, introducing ourselves and, and saying, hey, you're not on campus, you're, you're part of a town um, and, and there are other people who live here too. Right. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> absolutely. I think that's very, very important. Um, is do we have a mechanism for getting a particular set of messages that uh, the selectman or the chief or you may want to get to them? Is there? I think there are several ways. There, there's the initial welcome packet. Um, one of the things that they mentioned is because they're now going to be collecting off-campus addresses. They and email addresses. They have the ability to target emails to specific segments of the population. So I, my understanding is that they can, you know, create a list of, of people with addresses in Sunderland and send them a, a Sunderland specific email. Um, so that's a, another way that, that we can work with UMass to get some of those messages out. That's terrific, thank oh, you. Terrific. So Larry? Yeah. One thing I would add is that please, the we had an earlier um, report by Lori and about the uh, contact tracing for COVID. Since we, the town of Sunderland, hasn't had a um, contact tracing, I believe, until it went back to May 9th or sometime in May. So we have a pretty good history about what, what has happened or what has been going on in the town of Sunderland since, since March when it first started. So I, I would say that 
if if all of a sudden we start to see our our rates go up, there two things would happen. One is that we we would have we we would get very more aggressive with the um, message that we're putting out. Second thing that we would talk to is we talk to the state as well as a um, for additional help in trying to get those messages out as well because then. And, if, and, and I'm actually glad to see the chief tonight because the governor's talking about empowering the local police and the state police more in an area, chief, I think you're probably uncomfortable with, right? Going. Yeah, well, we've, we've had discussions with that across the state regarding whether or not local law enforcement and state police would be tasked with doing that. That has been said uh, through some media outlets, but um, the latest email I read Mass Chiefs was regarding getting clarification from the governor's office before uh, we push that out to the uh, the staff. Well, and I, I would just like to add, I mean, we're, we're going to a thing about defunding police and about what police are actually being used for. This is, this is a no, in my opinion, this is a, uh, something that the police weren't, I don't think ever envisioned to go around because they see eight cars parked out in front of a house and walk in the right. backyard and say, hey, is something going on back here? Right. Yeah. Right. I, 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 don't, I and, and so I will go back to what we, what we have been saying all along is that people, all people, it doesn't matter if you're a student at Frontier Regional, elementary school student or a college student, and or if you're a senior citizen, you have to take your personal responsibility um, to do the right things. And I, I think everybody is saying that. And, and Chief, I, 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 I think that you guys potentially could be put into a very difficult position on that. And I, I think at some point the board may want to work with you about with a policy for you guys as well. So, I, I, and again, because I, I think you guys do a wonderful job. Can we do better? Absolutely. And you'd be the first person that says that. Um, but here, here it is. We're, we're, we're putting additional, a new task on the police that nothing can good come over, you know, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, we're lucky to have the, the police force that we have here in town. And I think we all appreciate it. And I think that's why it's important to let the students or whoever it is, but it just happens to be an influx of students right now to do our best to let them know, one, how welcome they are, and two, what's expected of them and, and not rely on somebody to just think they can have a party with 60 people and then right. here's, here we are and our, is our chief having to figure out how to respond to something like that. I was also wondering, um, do, is UMass going to be sharing uh, with the Board of Health or somebody when, if, they, if they're doing testing and finding uh, COVID, COVID in, 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 our, in, Sunderland. in Sunderland, will they be sharing that with you? That, that was one of the uh, topics of discussion with the Board of Health Chair is how that communication is going to work. And my understanding is that um, we uh, either have or will be putting our, our public health nurse who's sort of in charge of tracking that um, in touch with the Un University Health Services, I think, um, who does that kind of work on campus um, to make sure that that everybody knows each other and the lines of communication are open, but that's certainly our expectation is, is that if they learn of somebody, um, especially somebody who lives in Sunderland is, is tests positive that they would inform us for contact tracing purposes. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And, and I think too, if they give us a list of all of the uh, Sunderland students, that'll help us kind of pinpoint where they are too roughly, you know what I mean? So we'll get a good idea of where we've got larger populations and things like that of them. I mean, obviously it's most likely the apartments, but there could be other, other things and we can see which ones have more and things like that. So that'd so, be useful. Piggybacking on that, if I could, Mr. Chair, 
So our larger property owners, uh, Jeff, um, their mechanism for communicating is simply public health, correct, EMD? It simply shows up and that's the way it is. Yes. So the, it yes. seems to me the awareness campaign might want to be centered around, might want to be centered around the actual res, the roof lines, right? Mm -hmm. The communications at the roof lines are going to be important, whether it's the big three or even the smaller ones that are scattered all over the town. How is it that we want to reach out to those property owner managers to communicate the best mechanism for feedback both ways. When we know something, they get to hear it. They get to post it in public spaces. When they hear something, they get to get back to us. So that it's important to bear in mind in this, in this current environment, a lot of people are hesitant about just like pushing information around. That said, this is public health. It shouldn't go beyond that element. And right, that's where I think the public health nurse is going to come in to play. Yeah, great point. Great point. So I would say if there is, if there is, I would suggest that if there's a mechanism to reach out to the larger property owners, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of units in three or four spaces. And that said, that's a pretty good concentration. And maybe the information can be paste, uh, posted out in those spaces. Uh, right. with help from the managers. Yeah, and when we had the meeting last week, uh, I explained to them that we have contact information for the managers. We yep. could forward to them, and then that way that would streamline it quicker instead of involving the police. Bingo. Yep. Great point, Chief. And and just to clarify, we're, we're talking about general education information, not a anything specific. Hey, somebody in your complex. No, that's, that's, right. the, that's the public right. health side. This is yep. just, just general information. Right. Anybody have any other questions or comments on uh, on the student topic for tonight? All right. That's all. Why don't we um, we got a few minutes here before we roll into our MVP resiliency plan? Um, how about we quickly discuss? Let's see. Do we see? I see that Steve Benjamin, our fire chief, is still out there. He's got an item for surplus fire equipment. Is there such a thing, Chief? <laughs> well, we like to use everything till it's not usable anymore. So right. inevitably, you get a uh, you get an inventory. And I don't think we've surplused anything other than uh, the old fire cruiser uh, for a long time. So what I prevented or what I presented uh, to Jeff was a list of things, uh, most notably a rolled engine two. Um, old radios, old fire hose, old air packs, and old turnout gear that uh, we need to uh, change its disposition, if you will. And uh, going in the, the uh, listing of most valuable, uh, the old fire truck uh, can't be used really for firefighting in the US anymore, uh, but it's still rolls, it pumps, the motor's good, it does have some value. Um, the value that was suggested to us by the, uh, the dealers that were bidding on our new truck was a couple thousand dollars. So I'd say it's probably less than five, quite frankly. Um, the, there's really, it's not a collectible. There's no real redeeming. Uh, it's not a collectible, Steve? Not yet not anyway, a, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! It's really. If we hang really, on to it long enough, will yeah. it be? <laughs> but if we hang on to anything long enough, it will be. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. But then comes the storage challenge, and I'm right. I'm all for putting something in a barn and forgetting about it for 50 years, and then all of a sudden it's got <laughs> value. There uh, you go. More, more, more. Um, you know, more can count on that word in the stock market, but. Um, the um, you know next would probably be uh, the air packs in terms of value. Um, there are companies that advertise that they will buy 
old air packs. Um, I haven't gotten a single one of them to return a phone call or, or an email once I've told them what we have. So um, I really don't know what the value might be for those, uh, those packs. The, um, the radio equipment, same thing. There is always some, some residual value. So once I'm free to dispose of that, I am probably going to contact uh, Kurt Seaman who handles the radio system for the FERCOG and see if there is anything that he would uh, determine as being valuable uh, that we could keep. Um, the fire hose has very little value. It's, uh, it's older, it's used the dimension, it's a three inch fire hose. And at the time um, that it was new, it was the thing to use. Everybody had three inch large diameter hose. That's what they called it. Now it's three inch has been eclipsed by four inch and uh, five and six inch large diameter hose. Um, six inch hose? Six inch Pull hose. Out of water through Man, that. You're gonna be a hefty guy to bring, a, <laughs> yeah. you're gonna be a hefty person to help lug around six inch hose. That's all I can say. The, the, oh the, my gosh, Stevie. The 100 foot lengths are not that popular. The 50 and the 75s are the most popular. Yeah, I, I would say 10 foot lengths. <laughs> True. Um, so it, the, the, the use for it would probably be construction, uh, discharge hose for pumps. Uh, most of those are two and a half, but. Um, so, so Stevie, what are, you asking, what are you asking it to be declared surplus for? Could, couldn't we, wouldn't be, you know, you, you have an association that does a one, that has supplemented a lot of things at the fire department. Wouldn't, wouldn't we be better off just, couldn't we just donate it to the, and then couldn't we, couldn't we get it somehow to the association so that they could dispose of it and, and get it back into our fire department? that would be something that the association is agreeable to. Um, you know what I'm saying, David, because the, the, I mean, the yeah. association, I mean, I can't, I can't, every time there's been a need at the, at the fire department, they never come to us for money. They just right. go to the association. Why not loop it back to them? It's up the money. Well, I was going to say, oddly enough, I was on Instagram the other day and I got an ad for a place that made things out of, old fire hoses <laughs> so there's there's clearly a market out there for that you know yeah they're they, uh, they're out they're certainly out there yeah. they don't you know you, you you can get rid of it easily enough getting somebody to give you a lot of money for it is a challenge uh, yeah exactly right because they got to make their profit off of it so naturally yep. um, and then just quickly the the old turnout gear uh once that is uh is past its life it can't be used any longer right. so um we can uh we, we'd probably dispose of that just in the garbage some of that is also used by craftspeople but again there's very little um we, we don't want to sell them or give them away in their entirety because mm -hmm. there's always a concern about someone misrepresenting who they are what they do with them yep. um, but th that the old gear would probably uh uh get sold or given away or disposed of to someone that's going to repurpose it for a craft purpose. Okay. All right. Do we have a, a motion to declare that surplus for the uh, association? Motion. I'll second. All those in favor? Hi. All right. Happy eBaying, Chief. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I would just, hey, Chief, I would just say that anything, wherever it goes, there's a disclaimer not to be used for uh, in the line of firefighting. Yes. Yeah. We're probably going to disable the, the hose and so forth so it can't be used for that purpose. And the truck would, will certainly come up with some language that will uh, have it be sold in the appropriate way. Okay, thank you, Chief. Great point, yep. All right, um, it'll be real quick. Uh, we have a, an appointment for the Energy Committee before we get to our 
MVP resiliency section of the evening. And this, Jeff, is for, uh, they've been recommended by the chair of the Energy Committee to uh, appoint Gabriella to the, Gabriella Fox to the Energy Committee. Correct. Motion. All right, do we have a second? I'll second. All right, all those in favor of appointing Gabriella Fox to the Energy Committee? Aye. 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 And uh, I'd just like to add a thank you to Gabriella for joining in, that's great. We appreciate it. All right. And I see that Alyssa is out there for a little bit of a different venue this time around. It's always a little tougher doing the meetings over Zoom because you really do lose a lot of, you know, the, the, the back and forth uh, and things that you have in a live setting. So it's always a little more challenging, but welcome. Hi. Hi there. All right. Um, should I just take it away? Yeah, go for it. We'll let you just hop right in and roll with it. Okay. Um, I'll introduce myself first, and then I'm going to share my screen, if that's okay. Yep. Um, so I'm Alyssa LaRose. I'm a senior planner at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Um, I've been working with the town of Sunderland um, since last fall on your municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. Um, and so tonight I'm just going to share a presentation that um, provides an overview of that process um, and where we're at right now, um, which is basically to get some final kind of public feedback into the, um, into the plan that the town has developed um, and hear um, folks' thoughts. So, and I know a number of you on the call have been involved in the process, so um, feel free to chime in um, if I, um, you know, say anything that's not correct. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yep. Okay. Got them right there. Excellent. Great. So, um, so just to back up and give a little bit of context into um, what the MVP planning process is all about, um, it's really related to trying to address um, vulnerabilities related to climate change. Um, and so part of what we do um, early on is to talk about um, what we know is already happening um, in terms of climate change in our region and then what the projections are. Um, and so what we're seeing are higher and extreme temperatures, both in terms of just a gradual increase in um, temperature over time, but also more extremes, like more days over 90 degrees than we're usually experiencing. Um, changes in precipitation. Um, there's a, this map um, on the screen is showing observed changes. So this is what's already happened in the past 50 or 60 years um, in terms of the intensity. So these are storms that drop a lot of precipitation in a short period of time. Um, and those are increasing, especially in the Northeast. Um, and so we expect to see more of that as time goes on. Um, and also because of the just warming of the atmosphere um, and, um, and more moisture in the atmosphere, there's just more frequent and intense storms. So the intensity of storms um, is increasing. Um, so that might include um, wind, but also flooding and, and things like that. So obviously these impacts uh, amplify existing risks that we might already um, have in the region related to our infrastructure. Um, so roads and bridges and communication lines and things like that, um, our economies, um, obviously, we're feeling that right now. Um, public health impacts, um, as well as obviously to our environment. Um, so in 2017, the state, um, the Executive Office of Environmental, of Energy and Environmental Affairs, um, EEA for short, launched the Massachusetts Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. 
um, to help towns with addressing um, some of these challenges that we're starting to see and that we expect to see as, as time goes on. Um, a lot of Franklin County towns are participating in this um, program. Um, and so this map actually probably is, I think is already a little old. I think we have a few more towns that are um, applying for the planning process. Um, but the blue towns have already been designated as an MVP community. So they've gone through um, the process that Sunderland is almost done with that we're talking about tonight um, and are now eligible to apply for certain grants at the state level. Um, a number of towns are in the planning process right now. Um, those are the yellow. Um, and then we do have some towns that have formed a regional partnership to go through the process, um, which was an option. So just a little more about the MVP program. The purpose is to build resilience and preparedness um, to these climate change impacts um, to improve pre-event planning, response and recovery, as well as long-term actions. Um, and the process itself is um, composed of a community resilience building workshop, which I'll talk about um, in the next few slides. Um, and then the development of an action plan um, and a report, which is available right now on the Sunderland website. Um, and then a listening session, which is what we're doing right now. Um, and then once a community is designated, um, as I mentioned, you are eligible to apply for action grants um, to implement priority actions that you have identified in your plan. So it is important to make sure that your plan reflects actions that the town really is interested in taking and feels is important um, because they do refer back to that if you're applying for grants. Um, so on October 19th um, in 2019, um, feels like a long time ago, um, on a Saturday, um, we had a pretty good turnout of town um, departments and boards, um, committees. We had some interested residents come um, to attend the Community Resilience Building Workshop. Um, again, at the workshop, we reviewed some of the climate change and natural hazard um, background information. So everyone was starting kind of on the same page. Um, after that, the, the whole group um, kind of talked about what are the top hazards that the town is facing and came to some agreement on that, which I'll show you in a couple slides. And then we broke out into smaller groups that were facilitated. Um, and you can see there's an example of one of the matrices that each group filled out um, where we identified the town's strengths and vulnerabilities concerning climate change in three different categories. So infrastructure, society, and natural resources. Um, and I'll talk a little more about what falls under those categories in a moment. And then the group came back together. We listed out all the action items that had been identified um, in the smaller group sessions. And then the group um, prioritized um, with sticky dots um, what they felt their top actions should be. Um, so when we were talking about the three different categories that we break out um, the vulnerabilities and strengths into, um, when we're talking about infrastructure, again, it's things like roads and bridges. The power grid came up a lot. Loss of power is a big concern. Things like drinking water, uh, wastewater, communications was another big topic that you'll see um, come up um, in the action items. Uh, housing, emergency shelters, schools, etc. Access to, to hospitals medical facilities um, and we talked a lot about access related to like evacuation um, particularly if you can't go um, across the river um, so that was also a, a big topic of discussion in terms of the town's residents and people who work in town um, um, we talk about things like public health impacts from climate change which could be anywhere from heat related illnesses or um, um, just having access to lifelines um, during an emergency, um, particularly for vulnerable populations who may have special needs. 
um, and just impacts on public services in general and the economy. In terms of environment, um, these would be, you know, the town's natural resources, including um, your farm, your farmland, um, your forests, your water, um, etc. So the group um, came up with four categories that were considered the top hazards, and then within each of those, we kind of identified um, some additional. Um, examples of what the group was most concerned about. Um, so high wind events was a big concern. Um, we talked about microbursts and particularly the area in town that's um, west section, I believe the flat area of town um, is susceptible to some really high winds um, or outages again um, related to this and wildfire also because wind can spread wildfire quickly um, and again especially in that kind of more open flat farmland area of town where there may not be many breaks to stop stop a wildfire. Um, the increased and, in, and changing precipitation um, is related to, again, heavy rain, ice, snow, um, more ice in the winter, for instance, um, more rain in the winter. Um, this obviously can lead to flooding and also just the um, extreme fluctuations in temperature and the, the extremes. So having a lot of rain at once, but then also having these periods where it's very dry. Um, and so drought is also falls into that category. And again, wildfire is um, in relation to, um, you know, lack of precipitation. Extreme temperatures came up as well. Again, this could be, um, it could be cold or hot. Um, we talk more about heat typically, but we have had some very extreme weather as well. Um, and this is also related to public health. Again, um, things like insect borne diseases, we've seen that um, cropping up more lately. And just the extreme fluctuations where it can go from being very hot to very cold very quickly. That's resulted in some really crazy weather um, and also can impact things like farms and crops. Um, and again, wildfire was mentioned. And then human-made hazards are things like hazardous materials. In particular, um, the area in the north um, east section of town where the railroad goes through, there is an aquifer, there is con there's concern about that area, potential contamination of drinking water. Um, there's some high hazard dams north of upstream of Sunderland, both on the Connecticut River and the Deerfield River that could cause some widespread flooding um, if they were to, to fail. Um, cybersecurity has come up as more and more an issue these days. And again, the power grid um, and even hacking of the power grid or, or things that would um, disrupt the power grid. And then Vermont Yankee was considered still a concern um, because there is storage of the um, spent fuel um, which is upstream on the Connecticut River. Um, so th those were the, the top hazards that were discussed. Um, in terms of top strengths, so we don't just focus on the vulnerabilities, but we also talk about, you know, what are the strengths that can be built upon? Um, a lot of residents are on public water supply, whether it's the water district or um, um, I think that you have um, a few smaller public water suppliers as well. Um, so not a, a, as many people on wells as a lot of our towns. Um, there's also very proactive emergency planning in town. Um, you have your um, Sunderland Emergency Preparedness Team that comes together and brings multiple disciplines together. And, and you really, sounds like I, it sounds like you do a great job of communicating amongst the different departments. Um, you do have communication and sheltering plans in place. Um, those could be updated and improved upon, which is um, reflected in the recommendations, but you have plans in place. Um, you have active community groups and, and volunteers and people who are really invested in the community. Um, and then uh, of course the abundant farmland um, and natural resources, um, some of the best um, you know, farm soils. Um, in the region and the nation um, in Sunderland. <clears throat> so um, based on those kind of discussions, um, these were the top priority recommendations that were developed. There's many more 
Um, and that's why I encourage folks to look at the plan that's on the town website. Um, these were considered um, the, the highest priority, but just because um, some of the others aren't on the screen doesn't mean that they're not a priority to the town. They are in the plan. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the priorities. Um, so one was to revisit and formalize the emergency communication plan. So as I mentioned, communication came up a lot, both in terms of the infrastructure as well as just the society, you know, communicating to residents, um, um, which you were just talking about. Um, and so part of that is to develop a backup plan um, if internet and cell service were to be down. Um, there's also a discussion about how do we get more um, of the, the rental, um, you know, residents who are renting to sign up for Code Red, um, which provides important emergency information. Um, they may not be aware um, that it's, you know, available. Um, and because there is, you know, turnover, um, significant turnover, that can be a challenge for the town. So really trying to figure out ways to encourage um, people when they move in uh, to sign up. Um, and then improving the town's ability to communicate to residents um, in multiple languages. The town is already doing this to a degree, but um, folks, you know, felt that it could be um, improved. And we talked about things like um, maybe working with UMass or some of the, the colleges around to try to um, maybe create some pre-recorded or pre-written messages that could then get people to the pl right place where they can then get more information about an emergency. Um, the next um, priority was to dredge the town park fire pond on Park Road. Um, and this has to do with increasing Sunderland's capacity to fight a wildfire um, in that forested area of town, so improving access to water. Um, but along with that is to improve and maintain fire access roads in forested areas. Um, concerns about being to able to access different areas to actually fight a forest fire. Um, and there are other wildfire related recommendations in the plan as well, but these were the top, top priorities. Um, there is a need to continue to track elderly and other vulnerable populations in town um, to make sure that their needs can be met during emergencies and evacuation events. Um, so this might be folks who are isolated, um, who have special, you know, medical needs or other special needs during an emergency um, or might lack transportation options. Um, develop an evacuation plan for when the Sunderland Bridge is closed. Um, so this was um, a big topic of discussion because it really cuts you off from a major um, evacuation route over to the highway, etc. Um, and so there's recommendations to coordinate with South County EMS to run a practice drill, um, as well as updating agreements with the PVTA and other bus companies and transit authorities for use of buses during evacuation. Um, I believe you do or did have an agreement with PVTA, but there was um, agreement that it should be looked at and updated. And then um, improving backup power at critical town facilities. Again, backup power um, and loss of power was a big topic of conversation. Um, so this involves, you know, having a formal procedure and a maintenance plan for the generators that the town already has, um, and it, including the portable generators. Um, but then also looking at exploring whether or not battery storage might be able to be added at the elementary school solar array. Um, you know, it was unclear if that would be possible or not, but to look into that, the elementary school is one of your designated shelters. Um, and then also just to review other town buildings to see if there's potential um, to add battery storage powered by renewable energy, such as solar um, panels, or potentially even small scale wind, um, if you have a wind resource. Um, so the MVP program won't fund backup power sources that are fueled by fossil fuels. So, um, you know, looking ahead towards a more, um, you know, renewable energy sources. Um, um, and I, I also should mention that um, 
when we did the initial workshop, we recognized that um, agriculture and farms weren't really well represented at the workshop. So we did reach out to farms a couple of times. Um, they're busy folks, <laughs> um, but I was able to talk to a few of them recently about you know, their concerns with climate change and resilience. Um, and one of the common themes that ran among the few farms that I did talk to was energy resilience for farms as well. So even though it's not included as a town facility, that is also included in the plan. Um, so that's something that they're constantly thinking about and, and working on. Um, so the next steps in the process is um, to collect public comment um, through this meeting as well as um, through a public comment period that will end at the end of August. Um, and so if you have a chance to review the plan on the town website, um, you can send comments in. Um, I believe we set it up so that Jeff Kravitz would be receiving them. Um, or you could call um, and leave a message. Um, and this is the link um, to the, the website. It's under the news and announcements section. Um, and then once the public comment period is over, depending on you know, the, how much comment we get, we may, you know, the town may have one more meeting to kind of finalize the plan. But the idea is that then it would be submitted to the state, you'd be designated as um, an MVP community, and then you'd be eligible to apply for MVP action grants. And there's three main categories, kind of broad categories that um, can qualify um, projects. Um, and so you'll see a lot of different things um, could potentially be covered, um, but they, it's really important to make sure you have it in your plan um, so that you can point back to your plan and say, this is something that the town identified. Um, so I guess I believe yeah, that's all I have. Um, I can take, you know, I can take questions. The Some of the folks on the um, call who have been part of this can help answer questions too, maybe. Um, and we can just open it up. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for all your work on that. We appreciate it. Uh, I know you put in a, a lot of time and effort on that. Thanks to everybody else who participated in the Saturday workshops and all the other meetings too. Anybody have any questions or comments or anything on the plan? And I noticed um, Jeff popped up a little thing about where the plan is available, reminded folks that it's available out on the website, so that's great. Doesn't sound like anybody's got any questions or comments at the moment. Yeah, so I, I, just, I just wanna reiterate that the, the point of having this listening session is to hear from the community. So if there's anybody out there that, that has a question, you know, the staff that's on here has been working and giving our input, but what we're really looking for here is um, feedback about uh, confirming that we're on the right track as far as identifying the top priorities and the vulnerabilities. Um, so really we're, we're looking, looking for for to hear from all of you um, about you know the the great synopsis that Alyssa just did and um, make sure we're headed on the right track. All right, David, this is Peter Gagarin. Hey, Peter, um, I just I got a question, hmm. um, and I guess I'm just really surprised, and I'm probably surprised in a nice way for something that's not on this whole list, uh, and that's clean air. Um, and it may be not on the list because clean air is not really a local thing. Um, but I was just thinking that, you know, I remember times over the year, many times over the years where on a day like today, there would be put out in the news, you know, there's a, you know, there's bad air today. So, you know, stay inside if you're, you know, old or vulnerable or even thinking of getting some exercise. And yep. that's not happening. And I think the, you know, that's not happening now, hardly ever. And I think you know, a lot of it is it's all regional and national because of the coal burning plants that are shut down and so on. And, and we're not hearing about acid rain all the time, but I didn't know if 
any mention of, you know, clean air concerns ought to be in, in this plan or not. You know, again, it's not a, it's not the kind of local thing you can do something about really locally. Yeah. Um, but boy, it is a big part of climate change and it's a big part of environmental concerns. Well, it's, it's a good point, because I, I actually had checked um, the National Weather Service forecast a little earlier before I came here and there is a heat advisory out. So they, Right, there's heat advisory, but not bad yeah, air. Yeah, right, because usually there's a, um, I don't want to say an ozone, but, but right, they usually would mention, you know, stay in and, you know, air you can avoid alert. it. Yes, thank you. Yep, and I haven't seen any of those, which is interesting because it has been such a hot, warm, and humid summer right. so far. So again, I don't know if any, you know, there any or to be any reference at all to that in the plan, but I would think that, you know, even if you have a reference but don't indicate any possibility of doing anything about locally, might be worth doing. Oh, uh, has anybody else included that, Alyssa, at all, or has it come up? Do you know? Yeah, um, no, air air quality has definitely come up in the context of public health and climate change. Um, and um, specifically, I can think of things like um, towns where trains tend to idle. Um, that can be a real problem. Yep. Um, and especially with um, when it is hot and, and different um, conditions can keep that, um, all of those emissions close to the ground. Um, so we can certainly, I'll have to look through it again to see if, if there's really anything in there. You're right, I don't think it's in the recommendations necessarily, but we can add some information about um, air quality impacts in terms of public health. Okay. Yeah, yeah, be good. And I don't know, I mean, the one place that I see things that, that are local that are directly affecting air quality is when you're behind a diesel truck yeah. Uh, uh, or a diesel of some sort, and they change yeah. gears, and there's a big cloud of black smoke comes out. And, right. Right. You know, we ought to at least get on record for like, what are we doing in terms of, you know, inspection, re you know, requirements and stuff like this to make sure that you know to see what can be done to continue to lessen that sort of stuff. And I know a lot of the older vehicles tend to be exempt from a lot of the newer regulations for that yeah. type of thing, um, and. That kind of makes me think of the, the truck stop on the other side of 91 there, where you'll get a lot of trucks idling and things like that too, over by the diner. <clears throat> but that's a, that's a good point, Peter. <clears throat> it kind of made me think too, it, oftentimes we have the library available as a cooling center this time of year, but under the unusual circumstances this year, we really don't have that available, so. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, that's come up as a, you know, a real concern this summer. And we did include a mention of, of COVID in the plan, just we didn't go into it in detail, but acknowledge that a lot of the items that related to communication um, would, you know, relate to the um, pandemic. But if there was anything, you know, specific that we should put in related to your experience with dealing with COVID, um, we can certainly do that. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, that's true because a lot of there is a lot of crossover in terms of things. <clears throat> um, I noticed that um, you mentioned insect problems uh, and various diseases related uh, as part of climate change, like uh, Lyme disease. We've got uh, also Triple E is up mm -hmm. is back this year. West Nile is back this year. I'm trying to remember at the meeting uh, in October, was there a discussion of some particular um, mosquito mitigations that could be done? Does anybody remember that? I feel like we did talk about it at one point. There was a collective. There, there was some group or collective that Sunderland might be able to join with. Does she yeah, remember? You doctor That's correct. There was, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, was Deerfield part of that group? Yes, so the plan does actually include, um, it wasn't included as one of the priorities, but it there is an action or a recommendation about exploring um, joining the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Mm -hmm. um, it does cost towns some money, um, and I think it's related to the, you know, the necessary um, 
testing equipment. Um, they, they test different areas for um, the diseases. Um, so that is in there. And then there also, um, Jeff had sent some state information about spraying. Um, and so we put some information in there about that as well as, um, you know, notifying landowners so that they know how to opt out of spraying if they want to. Um, so we do have a, a couple things related to that, but if there's more um, to add, we absolutely <coughs> add more. One of the other things that was um, included in the list when you go through is attention to and maintenance uh, of the ditches. And if those are flowing freely, there'll be a lot less standing water. And that's another element that could help us with the mosquito situation too. Yep, and we're, we're gonna, we're looking at like sort of kicking up our effort rather than doing just a, like a volunteer group. That's one of the things we're looking at. <clears throat> Although we've gotten a little reprieve of, from it from this year at least. But yeah, you're right. <clears throat> and that, that contributes to flooding in other areas and things like that too, so. That is on our list. Um, and we can just remind folks too, if you have any, uh, send those comments in if, and the gentleman in the upper corner there will be receiving them. I'll be glad to collate those and send them off to Alyssa and everything, so. Hi, this is, uh, hi, this is Liz Foster. Um, hey, Liz. I just wanted to say thank you uh, because the areas that I wanted to hear about uh, in that report uh, were um, ways of dealing with people, either, either our seniors or people with disabilities and, and making some sort of an emergency plan for evacuation or at least awareness of their situations so that we could act if we needed to. Um, so I was, I was pleased to hear that that uh, is, is in the plan. And also just to let you know that um, Life Path Incorporated has an emergency plan around those issues with seniors and with um, people with disabilities. So they would be uh, probably, um, if you haven't already, uh, a good organization to talk to to sort of dovetail that with our own plan so that we're not duplicating effort and, and um, we're, we're doing what might not be done. Thanks. Um, good feedback. Yeah, that's great to know. Thank you. You're welcome. And then the other um, point is that I live on Cross Mountain Road, which is in the woods, deep in the woods, and fire is always... Um, you know, on our mind when we have droughts or when we have uh, parties on the on the mountain. So um, I appreciate all the thought that's gone into that as well, because that was on several different lists. Especially this year, it's so dry, so. Yeah, very dry. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, appreciate the Thank feedback. <clears throat> all right. Well, I think um, unless anybody else has any other comments, I'd like to thank Alyssa for all her work and her presentation tonight. And check out the town website. There's more information there. You can view the plan there as well. So if you want to have a look at that, that would be a great place to start. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who's participated um, in the process. Thanks. All right. Have a good night, right. everyone. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. All right. You want to do public comment, Dave? Sure. Anybody have any general public comments tonight? <clears throat> no? Okay. So, so uh, David, can I ask the school committee um, to tell the town what the so the result the committee has about I see a couple of members on maybe they they could take a second and explain to the town that this where the education looks should be going forward yeah that's a good point Tom <clears throat> are they okay, can great. you hear me yep we can hear you just fine how are you oh let me tell you uh <laughs> it's busy and it's it's not slowing down um Last week, the uh, Union 38 and then later Frontier held votes, uh, which said that the, the plan going forward would be to do uh, 
a hybrid model uh, and exactly how much uh, in class that would be uh, is still something that was being refined. Um, there was, uh, you know, we were still waiting on some guidance from the state and it might have been something as, uh, as limited as, you know, uh, every now and then uh, a few kids outside or, you know, uh, more or less a sort of an a B schedule with uh, a lot of kids in the in the building at a given time, uh, and we're still here getting uh, surveys back. Surveys due tomorrow, or sorry, the twelfth, uh, as to what parents are planning to do. Whether they're planning to keep their kids home or uh, continue with a hybrid, but also late breaking, uh, we've had some uh, concerns about whether or not there was complete information during that vote. Uh, and so there is a, a school committee meeting that's going to be posted. Uh, it'll be Thursday evening. I think it's going to be, uh, I left it up to the administration. Uh, the start time will probably be between five and seven to be determined. Uh, this, Thursday, this Thursday, Greg? But it's entirely possible, this Thursday, uh, but it's entirely possible that uh, the issue could be revoted and uh, Sunderland Elementary could be full remote. Um, and there will be an opportunity for a public comment there. So, uh, you know, a lot is still up in the air. I wish I, wish I had uh, something more definite to share, but uh, that's where we're at currently. Uh, and, and just to tag on that, I, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think there may be some uh, Parallel questions uh, at Frontier, but I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah, that's that's for them to figure out. Okay. And I, I noticed um, New York State was sort of tying their, they gave permission for the schools to open, but they were tying it to um, actual case numbers. So in other words, if you got above X percent, I think the threshold was 5%, then they would go like shift back to remote because of that. For sure. And this was yeah. still to be determined. Uh, the idea would almost be like there was a big red button. And even if we were to go to hybrid, whether it's earlier this year or at some point in the future, uh, that, uh, and this was to be worked out again with our Board of Health and uh, based on some guidance from the state, but not necessarily, you know, taking it at face value, uh, running it through our own sensibilities. But uh, even if we were to go hybrid at some point, it's with the understanding that should conditions deteriorate either with a, a local case or uh, or some like spike nearby, uh, you could very quickly back to full uh, remote. All right, so you've got a, a essentially a backup plan for that. Right. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thanks for that update, Greg. Certainly. <clears throat> I, I know, Greg, the, uh, personally, I think that uh, when you probably ran for school committee, you never thought you'd have to uh, <laughs> take on such an emotional decision. Yeah. I, I can just tell you, I can just tell you what Steve oh, yeah. told me 20 years ago. And he says, you have, you have to make your decisions based on the information that you have and what you feel on and what you feel inside of you. And, and that's, that's basically what that, that he always said is, is that that's, and, and it may seem simplistic, but I think at the same time, it, you have to be true to yourself. So, and just get all the information. I don't think you guys, yeah, have, absolutely. you don't have an easy decision, no matter what, no, and you got to remember also, no matter what your decision is, there's somebody going to disagree with you. So just do the best you guys can do. I appreciate that. I think everyone is voting their conscience, and and for sure, um, we're gonna we're gonna do the best we can by you know try to understand what the the will of the community is, uh, including all stakeholders, and try to use our own judgment based on what we have for facts to find a path forward that uh, that we think makes the most sense. Absolutely. That's all you can do. I know everybody connected with the schools has been busy going, doing a lot of work on that. And it's been a busy year between that and a number of other topics. So I appreciate all the work and effort, effort everybody's put in. Hey, David, if I could just add uh, yeah. 
I just like to thank Greg for his leadership on the committee and in dealing with this stuff. And uh, he's been a steady hand and, and, and much appreciated. And so thank you. I would agree. Thank you. And, and this Greg. is, this is uh, you know, we had the vote last week and, and I think everyone would have said, who knows how long this is going to be good for. Because, exactly. Because who yeah. knows how the circumstances change. And, and it's, I find it just so difficult because no matter what you do, there are going to be people that are having a real hard time, you know, and there are people that are having a real hard time because their kids aren't able to go to school. I'm talking about the parents having it. I mean, the kids having a hard time and also right. the parents having a hard time. Okay. But you're also having people that are rightly really scared about going to school. And that's whether they're kids or the parents of the kids or the teachers. And so there's just, it's just really hard. And, and, you know, Greg was talking or Tom was talking about, well, you've got tough decisions and you got to make them, but you do the best you can, but boy, it's still, you go home and you just, you know, it just, it, it, it tears at you. Yep. That's a, that's an excellent description. All the time, right, Scotty? Yep. All the time. Yeah. All the time. It's a yeah. common feeling in this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. All right, but, thanks. You know, I, I, I think the, the one thing I've, I've, I've read through the, the different <laughs> options that the school administration has presented, I think um, I, I think they presented three um, well thought out plans, I think. In, and, I, and I also know that you guys as, as well know is that a, no matter what of one of the three plans that you ch was, is chosen, some, you, you just got to make it work for, for everyone and everyone may not be able, it may not be the same for everybody. And that's the hard part. And as long as we realize that, and as long as we have options so that everybody has an option to, so that we can look for success for all our students. I mean, some, some, some students are doing exceptionally well with, without going to classes. Some are not doing very well. Um, right. So we, we gotta, we gotta find that middle ground somehow. Yeah. And their, and their families in all sorts of different circumstances. Absolutely. You know, and that's something that, you know, you can't, you can't just, you can't forget about because, you know, something that would suit one family pretty well, another family, it's virtually impossible for. And so, you know, that's, again, that's part of what makes it tough. Well, you, you, look, at, you, you look at, you look at UMass, Peter, and, and, you know, people say, you know, it, the decision UMass made, but you have to ask yourself, so, to some, to some students coming back to Amherst is, is, their best option for learning, you know? Um, and, and we all have different, we all have different, you know, they all, everybody comes from a different home life, a, a place, you know, some people don't have internet. You look at, look, look at some in just our hill towns, a lot of our places don't have internet access, right. you know? So you're, you're, if you don't have internet access, how do you do remote learning? So- it Makes it pretty tough. It is. Yeah. And in our, in, in our hill town, a lot of our places in the Hilton are doing some very creative things right now to get internet access. So, um, it, 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 again, one size does not fit all in this, and, and it's a tough decision. And, and you guys are going to have to listen to what our what our resident. Don't be like Sturgis, where sixty percent said don't bring people the Sturgis rally this year, and they go ahead and do it anyway. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> we're all learning a lot this year. That's for sure. Yes, we are. Yep. <clears throat> All right. All right. Thanks, guys, from the Greg and Peter. Appreciate the input. All right. We just have a few things left on our agenda. I, I see we got a CPA rental assistance agreement on there, Jeff. Yes. So um, one of the uh, CPC articles at town meeting was $50,000 for emergency rental assistance for those affected by COVID-19, um, you know, losing their jobs, uh, they have to be income eligible. And this is going to be a <clears throat> program run by the Franklin County housing Re redevelopment, housing and redevelopment authority. Um, and so just, uh, they, they've signed the agreement. Um, the CPC has signed the agreement. So, uh, once the, the select board also signs, then we'd be able to, to get them those funds and start getting it out to people who need it. All right. Um, 
We take a vote on that just for the, the record. Motion. Second. All, right. All those in favor of signing the agreement? Aye. Aye. All right. <clears throat> and we have two more things left. We have an AARP age friendly communities application. If I could, Mr. Chair, I see Aaron yes. and, and Gabriella on the on the line. They may well be waiting for their appointment, which has been made earlier in the meeting. Ah. Do you have any questions on that, Aaron, or anything? No. Um, we're grateful. We're excited to have Gabriella on board with us. Uh, she is uh, going to be a very important asset to our committee, and. Um, we're glad that Select Board agrees with that uh, decision. We appreciate your volunteering, Gabriela. Yep, thank you. Happy to do that. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> That's true. We did cover that much earlier in the evening. There was a lot of other, a lot of other things, uh, of water under the bridge since then. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> um, so we've got the AARP age-friendly communities application, Jeff, right? Yes. So I can try to describe it, but yeah. Liz, if you're still on, if you want to, you have a, probably have a better grasp than I do. Um, and so part of, part of the application, I'll say, is a, a no. letter of support by the you know, chief executive, um, which is what this letter would be. And, but I'll throw it over to Liz to actually talk about the program and the benefits of being designated an age-friendly community. Thanks, Liz. Well, <laughs> I wasn't exactly prepared for that. Sorry. A little bit and how we got <laughs> in, where we want to go with it. Um, there was an informational workshop last December uh, at the FERCOG, and there were a lot of community partners brought together that were senior center directors, and um, there were a few um, town officials and there, were, there was a presentation made um, just to let us know about this program that basically is to help communities make their communities age friendly and in some also dementia friendly. And all of the education that goes with that and all of the resources that are needed to learn about it and then to implement it in your community. And I guess I, I would really like to point out that it's very well vetted by the state. Um, this program is a nationwide program. However, I think there are only about eight, eight or nine states that are currently signed up for it. I think COVID has put a huge uh, dent in the uh, progress that it was making. And so um, Massachusetts was the second state in the nation to sign on to it, uh, Maine, New York, Colorado, uh, and others that I can't mention, I can't remember. Um, so it's a very vetted program. Um, our governor was very interested in the aging population of Massachusetts. And so he kicked this, um, what do we do about this to the governor's council who kicked it to um, elder affairs, who kicked it to the Mass Healthy Collaborative Network. <laughs> so um, again, it's been through um, a long process with the state. So I just wanna make that very clear if it's something that you're not that familiar with as a program. Um, so the program starts um, with basically education. That's what it's about. And it's really kind of funny because they have, they have all these different levels of it. One is, you know, an informed community. And the next one is a, uh, before you get to the participating level, there's like three levels that you go through that you get a title for. So that's very exciting. But the very first thing that we have to do is to um, write this letter that Jeff has already written to AARP to, um, to be approved for the program. And um, since Sunderland has already um, done, I did read the letter, um, but Sunderland has already done uh, a lot in the way of, of this preparation, our elder housing, our um, the, the streetscapes that we've done and the um, making it more uh, travel friendly and that sort of thing. So we, you know, we have a good record already. You know, we, we've reinstituted our Council on Aging now to look into these things as well and to be supportive of them publicly. So I think that um, there wouldn't be any question that Sandra One would, would be approved. But anyway, I think it's an important um, tool to have going forward uh, because it does also 
like everything else, do you access ultimately to money? Uh, and and that yeah. never hurts. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, and you're right, we've, we've done, tried to do a lot as a community. And I think it's important to be a community for everybody in the community, not just one particular demographic. Yeah, exactly. Well, there are, there are a lot of pieces to this program. I mean, they have they have an LGBT piece. They have you know they have a lot of different pieces to it. So you can you can glean on to as many as you want. You know. That's so. all right. That's all I got, Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's sorry. Right. That's good. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. But yeah, it, you know, it, it's a network and it, it provides access to also best practices so that we, we're not having to reinvent the wheel. It That's gives good. us, in addition to monies, you know, technical assistance of how other communities have dealt with similar issues and um, can help spark our creativity on, on the issue of aging in place. And I think, especially in rural communities, I think it's a little more of a challenge than in yes. urban ones. We have yeah. That's, you know, less access to resources and it's more difficult to get a hold of resources and things like that. So it's a little more challenging for us. It's, it is. And, and um, the eastern part of the state, there are many, many communities that are, are and have been from the beginning um, members of this. But in western Massachusetts, there's very few. In the Pioneer Valley, there's almost, there's only two that I know of. And, but Berkshire, the Berkshires did it a little differently. They went as a community. They put all the pieces, all the towns together there, yep. which I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure it works for them and that's why they did it. But um, we have such differences in size and in, you know, in population and in, I just think it's better in a way to be done town by town, even though it's more work. So. Yeah, and then you can also cooperate regionally on things like we do at the exactly. senior center and things like that. So, exactly. all right, great. Um, will we get will we get cool road signs upon entering towns like like the Purple Heart ones? <laughs> I was just saying, we're going to need a sign to put all of our signs on. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, move to move to sign the application. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a second. All right. All those in favor to sign the AARP application? Aye. Aye. All right. Three to zero on that one. So there we go. We've taken our first step. <laughs> We're well informed. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've reached the informed level. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, Next up, and I know we also have um, select board and town administrator updates too, but our, our next item I think we do is the discussion of benchmarks for employee wage adjustment and COLA. And I see that you've provided some excellent graphics this time, Jeff. Yes. Um, so it, one of the things that was raised and uh, I don't even know if it's worth pulling up on the screen. I, I can just yeah. describe them, but is yeah. was um, how state aid has changed um, over the last few years. And I think in the last five years, it's gone from 25% of the budget down to 23%. Um, and that's only in five 20, yep. years. I'm sorry, 22? 22, 22 yep. So maybe I should have brought, put the graphs on. <laughs> that, no, but that's, that's an okay. important, it's a very important number. It, it is, and, and again, that's only it's only in five years, um, you know. And and the discussion I think two weeks ago was talking about where we were a decade ago. And um, if if you want me, I can I can try and go back that f even further, and and we can look at those. But I just um, I I recall hearing the last five years, so I wanted to provide that information. I I, I actually think Jeff, what, why I asked for it is because I mean. I, I was at a I was at a meeting one time with uh, Senator Saugus. Paul Saugus was a long time ago, yeah. and and at the time, some somebody asked him a question, and and he responded, "Well, never ask a question that you know the answer to." And but it, it's kind of interesting that I I thought if we if in your spare time, um, <laughs> I know we have a lot. <laughs> But it, it would be nice to go back, you know, 10, even 15 right. years to, to look at look at how that 
look at how it's changed because we know because we see it we deal with the budget all the time and we see less we see less state aid coming back to the communities yep. um, and, 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 and a big nut is education. And I, I really, at some point, like to have a conversation with our state and our, you know, our state senator and our state representative about the decreasing, decreasing amounts of money that are, that are coming back to the communities. Um, and I think these numbers help them understand what we're saying also. And, and that's why I do think it's important. Yeah, and I, especially like I was just kind of visualizing, like I could see like a bar chart with like a trend line because that'll be really illustrative to see that deep drop over time, you know? Yeah, and, and one of the interesting things that I think it came out Friday was uh, the Division of Local Services put out basically an Excel template spreadsheet where you just plug in sort of numbers for the last 10 years and it'll give you graphs and, um, you know, you plug in your population numbers and your school age children numbers and I think there are maybe 11, um, 11 different indicators, economic indicators, and it's basically to give a community an idea of their financial health overall, um, you know, gross revenues, uh, expenses. And um, so I'm gonna be working on that and that that has a, a longer time frame um, and okay. might provide some additional information uh, that you'd be interested in. Yeah, it'd be great to see some of it up on the website too, I think. Yeah, yeah, that, that could certainly be a report that we update annually and, yeah. uh, and post. So tying that into our um, some benchmarks for doing the wage adjustments and everything, we're going to need to be able to use that to see where we are with our revenues and everything so that we, you know, we hopefully, I don't know how good things will be, but hopefully we'll be able to do it, but we'll have to see how, how things go. I couldn't miss a chip. It, no. From my perspective, the only reason that it, the only thing we need to do is keep this on our agenda. Since our last meeting, the governor signed a budget into November. Yep. That doesn't that doesn't help us a great deal. <laughs> it just says November. You take another look at it, and maybe there's something that comes of it. Today's news showed that today's Department of Revenue report showed that although there was a slight increase in uh, revenues to the state, the, there was not enough to erase the three plus billion dollar shortfall in the last months of the prior budget season, meaning up to July. Right. Yep. So that, that said, it's all of a moving target and we need to be able to keep these, uh, keep this discussion in front of us. We're not gonna make it, uh, my own opinion is, we're not gonna make any decisions before November regardless. Right. We have to keep, we have to do this in keeping with the intent of the warrant article at the annual town meeting. Absolutely. Excellent point. Yep, that's correct. Not much we can do right now except say November, but keep right. it in front of us. Yep, and just keep watching it, right? Because I was looking at those same numbers today when they came out. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. All right. So that'll be a, a recurring topic. <clears throat> All right, and then we've just got uh, select board updates. I don't have anything new right now. I don't know if anybody else does. Tom? Scott? Uh, two, me two meetings this week, tomorrow night, five o'clock, Frontier Capital Planning, and then Thursday morning, 9 a.m., uh, police negotiations. Right. And with that then, we turn it over to the town admin for any other, anything else that he hasn't covered already or wants to get to discuss. You know, I just um, wanted to note that I'm going to be on vacation to Texas. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, for three weeks. No. I think, I think there's something wrong with my audio. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> um, I, I, and I did schedule you for a meeting next week and I will be, I will be on and I will have a uh, thing. Thinking of resiliency, a, a backup plan just in case um, I do have any <laughs> Wi-Fi 
and I'm not holding up the meeting, but there is an important thing, which is um, voting and, and signing the order of taking related to the easements on North Main Street, and that's time sensitive um, in order to meet our, our deadline for um, getting that project out to bid. So, um, but I, you know, we, we have the, the order, the draft order of taking, so I think we're in good shape and I'll have all that okay. information to you as soon as possible. Um, so hopefully that can be a, a fairly quick meeting, um, but to, you know, I, I, that's all I had. Okay, all right. yeah, we got to keep that project on track. That's an important one, so. <clears throat> all right. I believe that is officially the end of our agenda this evening. <clears throat> anybody has uh, any other comments? And if not, if anybody wants to make a motion to adjourn. Motion. A second. second. All right. All those in favor for adjourning. Uh, and I should just point out briefly first that um, our next meeting will be next Monday, August 17th at 6.30 p.m. right here on the same exciting Zoom channel. So. Perfect. All right, all those in favor of adjournment? Aye. Aye. All right, three to zero. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.